Hey, Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution. The right of the people to be secured in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizure shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Two main terms that you must pay attention to in this is this thing called unreasonable. So what is reasonable and what is unreasonable? And then this thing called probable cause. What is probable cause? Ask yourself, do you know what probable cause means? Do you know what a reasonable search and seizure constitute? Do you? Now, for the basics, there are many different tricky words that are used. When it comes to probable cause, reasonable suspicion, warrant, support, and affidavit. And those tricky words are one, detainment, two, seizure, and three, arrest. Let's start with the word arrest. That word arrest does not constitute your formal act of being handcuffed or being put in a squad car. That arrest simply means if anything that you were doing at any given point has been put to rest or temporarily altered, hence the word arrest, then the moment anyone stops you, begins to ask you what's going on, begins to ask you for an ID, begins to say, hey, we got a call about somebody being here doing this, you have been arrested because whatever it is that you're doing, if you cannot keep doing it, you are under arrest. Whatever activity you were doing prior to that man or woman coming in front of you, if that thing was halted so that you could carry that conversation or attend to the presence of that man or woman in costume who is armed, you have been arrested. To arrest something is to halt it, to put it on hold. Another word is detainment. Everything is focused on them investigating a crime and at that point it's up to you to make sure that they articulate whether a crime existed is existing that they witnessed or that is about to exist that's detainment and in an arrest they require probable cause for a detention they require reasonable suspicion with a reasonable suspicion the things they can do is limited the type of search is limited with an arrest they have more leeway to do more and then the word seize the word seize is synonymous to detainment and arrest both and seizure is not limited to just you, your physical body. It can be anything else. It can be the seizure of your rights. It can be the seizure of your body. It can be the seizure of your effects and properties. Effects being your right or intangible things. The property being your phone, your automobiles, your key, your pen, whatever it is. So keep that in mind. Probable cause. Probable cause is a requirement found in the Fourth Amendment that must usually be met before police make an arrest, conduct a search, or receive a warrant. Courts usually find or receive a warrant. Meaning the probable cause is what gives right rise to the existence of a warrant. And something has to have happened or exists for a warrant to be issued. That something is called a probable cause. So probable cause precedes a warrant. Courts usually find probable cause when there is a reasonable basis for believing that a crime may have been committed or when evidence of the crime is present in the place to be searched. And then there's another term called exigent circumstance. 
which during the earlier stages we spoke about, which basically are emergency circumstances where if you're about to escape or if something is going to manipulate or alter the, the crime scene and it's an emergency, or if it's going to endanger yourself or the public, then they don't require a warrant to seize or search you. So it goes on to say, under exigent circumstances, probable cause can also justify a warrantless search or seizure. Persons arrested without a warrant are required to be brought before a competent authority shortly after the arrest for prompt judicial determination for probable cause. Meaning whatever the municipal police says is actually not the finality of the probable cause. Because if it is, then due process is not being afforded you. Could have missed something. Although the Fourth Amendment, which speaks about no person shall be arrested without warrant, you know, probable cause, etc. Although the Fourth Amendment states that no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause, it does not specify what probable cause actually means. And this is the open doorway. The Fourth Amendment requires that no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause. It does not specify what probable cause actually means. So tell me, all these people going on about probable cause, do they even know what probable cause is? Do they know the details of what constituted based on each circumstance? Because each circumstance is different. And each circumstance that's different leads to a different avenue of how things are determined when it comes to probable cause. Meaning they give an open leeway to determine what this word probable cause means. And that is a loophole itself. The meaning of the term probable cause. Let's go to this word reasonable suspicion. Remember, they said something about something that's reasonable, something that the average of your everyday man will do or not do. And you will find that most municipal police just throw this buzzword around. Literally, they'll just throw it around because they've been instructed to do so. That is why you have to know what constitutes these buzzwords so that you can free yourself if they bind you or you can prevent yourself from being bound as they run their mouths. Most of these municipal employees don't know these things and they don't care to. They get fed certain information and buzzwords, they get shown videos, they get conditioned into the culture so that if they hear these same buzzwords, they think something is wrong with you and they try to take advantage of you. Because they also know that the average man or woman just hears the buzzword, but don't know the details. So they're thinking, oh, you're as dumb as me. But guess what? I have a badge, a costume, and a firearm, and I'll create a police report against you. And you don't know how to mitigate or litigate this matter. You don't want to be that man that's opposing it. You, though, you want to be that man that's going to be garnishing their check. You want to be that woman that's going to be putting a lien on their property. You really want to do that? You want retribution and restitution? You have to know the details as to why what they're doing is not constitutional. You have to know the loopholes behind what they're being trained to do and the buzzwords that they're using. Just like there's continual education with any type of uh, occupation, there, there must be continual education and things of this nature because it's constantly evolving. You must learn it. And if you keep the foundational principle in mind, you will realize that the way that it is evolving, in many cases, actually align with the foundational principles. And the loopholes that doesn't apply, you'll be able to see it and be able to act accordingly. You must have continual education. Don't be stuck on the requirement of affidavit for warrant. Don't be stuck on probable cause. Even worse. Most people don't know what probable cause is. <clears throat> so part of what creates probable cause is something called reasonable suspicion. But before we go into it, one thing you need to realize that suspicion itself and reasonable suspicion itself is not a crime. Eight out of ten municipal police that you will come across that uses this word they will use it in the context as though the suspicion itself is the crime. 
and because they are saying that the suspicion or implying that the suspicion is the crime they will charge you with something else like disorderly conduct trespass failure to identify so they will retroactively create the crime why because they say you're suspicious even though you were not trespassing even though you were not creating disorderly conduct even though you are not obstructing identification remember terry stop stop and frisk that terror stop is a loophole that they use to demand ids meaning okay i don't have a warrant but i can search you and i can make certain demands of you and certain states have adopted that and we'll go over that also and certain states have not they call it stop and id states or in some cases stop and frisk but usually before anyone demands an ID of you, a crime needs to first be investigated. Then they need to know who might have committed it, who is committed it, or might be involved in it. But unless original suspicion of that actual crime exists and they have actually articulated it, then they can't demand, demand you of an ID. Now, they don't have to tell you the specific crime because they're not obligated to. But they are in order to demand any information of you or anything that could lead to them accumulating your biometric data, which is your right to privacy. They have to articulate why they are making that demand of you and why they're trying to make you a party to a supposition of a crime. And how they do that is called reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion is a standard used in criminal procedure. Reasonable suspicion is used in determining the legality of a police officer's decision to perform a search, aka probable cause. Remember, legality or legal is just the operation of law. And then probable cause is just a clause or a term used in the law called the Constitution, state or federal. When an officer stops someone to search the person, courts require that the officer has either a search warrant, the basic stuff we know, probable cause to search, which gives rise to the search warrant or a reasonable suspicion to search. If you don't know this, you are setting yourself up for a world of pain. Be familiar with this, and not just the word itself, but the details of what it constitutes. Because again, the majority of the cops that will approach you, do not know, they do not know the details of what this means. You should though. In descending order of what gives an officer a broadest authority to perform a search, meaning they give them a huge discretion as to how they can define or put to use this word called reasonable suspicion. Courts have found that the order to search, the order is search warrant, probable cause, and then reasonable suspicion. So the foundational principles still remain that they need a warrant, which must be created by a probable cause. And if neither of this exists, then a reasonable suspicion will suffice to work. Meaning it's a last option. But I guarantee you, they're not gonna use this as a last option. They'll use this as a sole and primary option. So now, reasonable suspicion is applied to a stop and frisk. Meaning we will search you. But in details before we know this, it just basically means the requirement between a stop and frisk as defined by Terry versus Ohio are this. One, when they do search you, it's not gonna be a deep search. It's just gonna be the surface of whatever you're wearing. And two, it must be short. It cannot be prolonged. I'm telling you, if they say that was just a terror stop and because of that, we found this drug on him or this firearm or this and that, and because of that, we're charging him with this. If it's not within a short period of time, and if it's not a literally a frisk, meaning they're not going inside your pockets, they're not digging under your armpits, literally, they, they, they're just going over the surface of it. That's what a frisk or a terror stop requirement is. And that's not a terror stop if they're not doing that. In Terry versus Ohio, the Supreme Court held that if a police believes that an individual has a weapon, meaning for the safety, the re one of the reasons why they will have a reasonable suspicion is to dispel the possibility that you are a danger to yourself or others. That's the third. I mean, it has to be within a short period of time 
It has to be very limited. And it has to be for the purpose of mainly searching for anything that could put yourself or anyone in danger. That an individual has a weapon which possesses a danger to the, to the officer, the officer may stop the individual to search the individual for a weapon. The court held that to determine whether the police officer acted reasonably in the stop, meaning reasonable suspicion, a court should not look at whether he has a hunch, but rather to the specific reasonable inference which he is entitled to draw from the fact and light of the experience, meaning reasonable suspicion is extremely specific to the circumstance that you're in. In Hybo versus 6th Judicial District Court, a Nevada state statute requires a person detained by an officer to identify himself by, during a Terry stop, which most likely they will always do, to identify himself by, that is in at Nevada by providing his name. Now, Hybo, the Supreme Court held that because the statute only asked for a name, meaning now they're looking into the state common law to determine what the details of identification is. Because remember, search or seizure. Searching you does not necessarily have to be a physical thing. Searching you can be a demand for an ID, demand for a name, date of birth, all that. That is a search. And that is protected by the Fourth Amendment or the respective clauses that goes along the same line in your state constitution. And that is also under Terry stop. So when they demand ID, they are performing a Terry stop. They are performing a search. And the laws regarding search is usually under identification laws in each state. In this case, for Nevada, as it applies to the Terry stop, They determined that because the statute only asks for a name in that state, not identification ID, and because it did not alter the nature of the stop itself, meaning for the purpose of safety, it has to be brief, and that it has to be least invasive method. Changing neither its duration nor its location, the statute properly balances the intrusion of the individual's interest against the promotion of legitimate government interest. Thus, the court held that the statute is constitutional. Now, let's look at this Terry stop, this stop and frisk. The Terry stop is another name for top stop and frisk. The name was generated from the U.S. Supreme Court case, Terry versus Ohio. So, this is one of those cases whereby they, someone sued the state, basically, and they took it to the federal level. When a police officer has a reasonable suspicion, which we just spoke of, which is a very broad term, but nonetheless applies to each circumstance. That's why it's broad, because it cannot be limited to a set standard because each circumstance would be different. And based on that, they can determine to invoke Terry Stop or not. So say, for instance, you were seen in a parking lot that was dark, but somebody called and said, hey, this guy is pulling on cars. But you weren't really doing that though. That call itself, they can say that's a reasonable suspicion, even though they didn't witness it. That man or woman who called and says this guy is pulling the cars, even though you weren't doing that, can serve as the affidavit itself. Even though that man or woman only did it verbally, and they might not even want to identify themselves or come into court. But that municipal employee, which is the police, might now come and say, I'm going to take the law into my hand and use it as a reasonable suspicion that you're committing a crime or that you have or that you're about to. Do you see the loopholes that they're using? And usually they will isolate this information from you and they will not tell you because they like to stay in control. In order for you to stay in control, you have to preserve information from people. And they will use that. Instead, they will play games with you and play mind games with you. So what you now have to do is, you don't necessarily have to tell them what they need to do, but use it against them. On the spot or afterwards. But on the spot, so that you save yourself months of headache, especially if you really don't know how to mitigate or litigate matters, know the details of these things and make the demand and stand your ground. 
when a police officer has reasonable suspicion that an individual is armed, engaged, or is about to be engaged in a criminal conduct. So it's not just limited now to weapons, it's engaged to a supposition of a crime. The officer may briefly stop, the keyword, briefly. If they're holding you longer than 15, 20, 30 minutes, that's not brief. And detain an individual for a pat down search of outer clothing. These are the specificities of a Terry stop. It has to be brief and it has to be your outer clothing. And it has to be for the purpose of removing any risk or danger of whoever it is that's being searched or the one that's searching or the general public to reduce danger for public safety. Again, to reduce danger for public safety, it must be brief and the search must be your outer clothing. If one of these three requirements do not exist and the cop is invoking Terry Stop in his police report, in the court document, or verbally, you must invoke your Fourth Amendment right or whatever the corresponding aspect it is on your state level. And let them know that whatever it is they're doing does not constitute a terror stop because of these three requirements. But they would, they will throw this buzzword reasonable suspicion and terror stop at you. But if you don't know what it means, because they will speak about it confidently. If you don't know what it is, they will get away with it. A terror stop is a seizure within the minute of the fourth amendment. Under these three circumstances, it has to be brief, it has to be a Pat down search of the outer clothing that has to be for the sake of removing danger. What is a pat down search? Pat down, pat down search is when a police officer pats down the outer surfaces of a person's clothing in an attempt to find weapons. Then they can't go into your pocket, dig into your pocket, dig into your crap. Your, your your private area, your shoulder, none of that. Put their hands in between your hair and none of that. A pat-down search constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. A pat-down search incident to an investigatory stop, which is a terror stop, are usually made without a warrant and justified if the officer has a reasonable suspicion that the person being searched is armed and dangerous. So if you're not armed and dangerous, why are they doing a Terry stop? And if they are, is it brief? Is it the outer surface of whatever it is you're wearing? And how does it contribute to the safety of the public at large? <clears throat> these are the basic things about Terry stops that a lot of people don't know about and is being used against them daily the reasonable the reasonableness of suspicion is reviewed based on the totality of circumstance meaning a lot of things has to be put into consideration and that just as much as it gives them the leeway to do anything it gives you the leeway to be pointing at certain things that you're not looking at the totality of circumstances before you do this at all. So why are you even searching in the first instance? You need to have to do an investigation. Remember, a terror stop is considered an investigatory stop. Investigatory stop is a brief stop. Again, here goes this word, brief stop. You see this common terminology. A terror stop is brief. So is an investigatory stop. They're not doing an investigation, but why are they searching you? Why are they patting the outer layer of your clothing? A brief stop that is not intrusive. Isn't that what we just read in Terror Stop? In order to conduct a stop, a police officer must have reasonable suspicion that a crime has been committed. The reasonable suspicion must be based on specific and articulable fact. What is it? What does it mean to be articulable? You have to be able to say it verbally. You know that totality of circumstance? The reasonable suspicion is reviewed based on the totality of circumstance. 
they have to articulate it to you. In order for them to do an investigatory stop, which is a Terry stop, it has to be brief. It has to be your outer layer of your clothing. It has to be for the purpose of public safety. It has to be also based on the possibility that you have a weapon on you. And it has to be articulable. They have to articulate. If they don't do these things, it does not qualify as a Terry stop, which is the loophole to the probable cause requirement, which leads to a warrant. So they're trying to do a warrantless search and seizure. They need all these basic things. And then the further details that leads to why they're even doing it based on your circumstance. You need to know these things. The reasonableness of suspicion is reviewed based on the totality of circumstance and both the subjective individual experience of the officer and the objective factor. It's the subjective experience, meaning whatever it is they might have experienced in the past, which they will bring this up. But guess what? It's nonetheless subjective because that might not apply to you. Then it goes, and the objective factors at the time will be taken into consideration. The more important thing is the objective fact, meaning it's not biased, it's not fixed to whatever it is they think is happening because your circumstance is unique and you must invoke it. For example, in Rogue versus State, the court found that because the police lacked specific information about the vehicle passenger during a valid traffic stop, the police officer did not have reasonable suspicion that the passenger was armed and dangerous. Meaning they have to have a reason to say, you're armed and dangerous, so I'm going to do a Terry stop. Or that, you know what, this is going to be brief, so I'm going to do a Terry stop. Or that, you know what, I intend to just pat down the outer layer of your clothing, so I'm going to do a Terry stop. Therefore, the police officer was not justified in the pat down search of the passenger. They can say they're doing terror stop all they want. They can utter to you that they have a reasonable suspicion all they want. If they don't articulate the fact behind the reasonable suspicion, it tells you here this reasonable suspicion must be based on specific and articulable fact. If they do not articulate it to you, and if it does not meet those basic standards of being brief, of it being an outer layer search, of it being based on the need to find a weapon on you, meaning they have to have a reason for doing this thing. And that could be your behavior, whatever it is that's involved, whatever it is. They are not justified to do the pat down. This is how they'll approach you. They'll tell you, if you tell them, oh, you need a warrant and probable cause, they say, no, we don't. We just need a reasonable articulate suspicion. It's a terror stop. And they'll just, they'll just do it. They'll search you real heavy, they will stop you, they will interrogate you, but you don't know the requirement of a terror stop and a reasonable suspicion. You don't know that they have to articulate the specific details behind that reasonable suspicion. That's what makes it reasonable. You don't know that it has to be only the outer layer of your clothes. You don't know that it has to be for the specific purpose of finding a weapon on you. You don't know that it has to be for the specific purpose of public safety, and you don't know that it has to be brief. Now you know. So don't let anyone throw those buzzwords at you telling you they have reasonable suspicion or that telling you they're doing a Terry stop and because of that, the Fourth Amendment or the requirement for a warrant or probable cause is void. No. There are conditions behind that. Otherwise, the primary requirement of those basic substantive rights of requiring a probable cause, which will issue a warrant, still stands. Don't let anybody pull the wool over your eyes. And you don't be stuck in limited concept that a probable cause, warrant, and affidavit are the only things. Because if you don't know and you're stuck in that world, they will throw you around like a rag doll. And you will just become a victim. You don't want to become a victim. You want to go beyond the realm of the mundane. Learn the basics. But don't add their dynamics and details to it. Because they've realized, man, we really can't do what we want. So we have to create loopholes. And so they did. 
But then in creating those loopholes, they realize that these foundational principles cannot be altered because once we do that, it can be used against us also. Because believe it or not, these foundational constitutional principles is what's protecting all these other tort feasors also. That's right. That is how they can claim judicial immunity. So you have to know these details and loopholes because within those loopholes, they leave open doors so that those foundational principles will still stand so that they can use it. The average man that reads these things, it goes over their head. They don't listen to you. One, it has to be brief. Two, it has to be the outer layer. Three, it has to be for the purpose of public safety. Four, they have to really, 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 really know that if I search this guy, I might find a weapon on him. Yet, they just throw it around in all these words over several court cases. How many municipal police do you know sits down and read all these things? They don't do it. What they do get conditioned into is they fire them up. They get them into a hypervigilant mode. They tell them, stay in control once you get out there. Don't have a conversation. Trick them. Lie. So they can get what you want. You formulate whatever you want in a police report and just make that bond. That's all we care about. Guess what? If you know what you're doing, it's a whole different reality. You are not just throwing buzz because they will throw buzzwords. You are not just going to be throwing buzzwords. You're going to be dealing with the dynamics of it. Don't use the buzzwords. Use the dynamics behind the buzzword. Which 8 out of 10 of these municipal police do not know. It's up to you to know it. And even though they don't know it, they get conditioned just enough for them to be able to make the municipal entity more money by enslaving you slowly but certainly. At the end of the day, you go home mad and upset. And then what happens? They get more comfortable. They realize, oh, even though this man or woman is upset, I can still get away with this. So I'm going to repeat it. And they're just going to keep doing it over and over. Now, say you have the will and the fire to stand up on a judicial level. If you don't know this dynamics and you're just stuck in probable cause, witness affidavit and a warrant. My friend, they're going to ignore everything you write in because you don't know these loopholes. You are being told the loopholes. Put it to use. If you're going to do a constitutional challenge. Invoke this substance and then tie it back into the Constitution. The Constitution is yours to use and to bring to life. Now we're going to go into all the Supreme Court cases That's, that act as a compilation for them to create that term, Terry Stop, Stop and Frisk, Reasonable Suspicion. We'll go over each Supreme Court case one at a time. There's a lot more, but we'll go over the main ones that they will use to define broadly those terms. The first one is Michigan versus Summers, 1981. We'll go over the more recent one also. So this is the highlight. It is clear that there are several investigative techniques, aka terror stop, which may be utilized effectively in the course of a terror stop. The most common is interrogation. So it's not like you see on television where they sit you in a closed room and then there's a CCTV run in and then a psychological uh, evaluation is done on you by looking at your, your body language, the tone of your voice, all that bullshit. That's not how it goes. In actuality, the moment they see you, they are, they, they are engaging in interrogation. They're engaged in interrogatories right there on the spot. The most common is interrogation, which may include both a request for identification and inquiry concerning the suspicious conduct of the person detained. So the mere act of asking you for identification is already interrogating you. Who do you interrogate? Someone who is involved in a crime. Someone who has been involved in a crime. Someone you suspect to be involved in a crime. So the moment someone asks you for an ID, they're in uniform and they are armed, they're letting you know that you have committed a crime that they're trying to figure out. 
So the mere act of being suspicious itself, though, is not a crime. The mere act of you saying that I am preserving my substantive right to privacy, security of person in effect, and to not incriminate myself is not a crime. Why? Because if we, as we've read, they have to articulate the objective nature of why they are requesting and demanding for that ID, why they are interrogating you, why they are engaging in an investigation. Investigation of what? A crime. They only need to identify you so that they can put on their record that this party was interrogated because of a crime. But what is the crime itself? That is the gray area and the step that is easily omitted by these municipal employees as though it's normal. That's where the whole concept of have I committed a crime comes in it. Merely hearing that buzzword of people repeating have I committed a crime, have I committed a crime, it's not enough. You have to know the details so that when you are taken advantage of or when you're right there in the heat of the moment, if these things are deeply engraved, engraved in your mind, you know what to expect. It has to be brief, it has to be the outer layer. The crime itself has to be objective. And they have to articulate in a manner whereby it shows that you yourself have done it. You're about to, not that you've done the crime, but it can be anticipated or it has to be witnessed. So it's past, present, and future. The most common is interrogation, which may include both, both a request for identification and inquiry concerning the suspicious conduct of the person detained. Sometimes the officer will communicate with others, meaning Remember that totality of circumstance, meaning they speak with others. Either police or private citizens, in an effort to verify the explanation tendered or to confirm the identification or determine whether a person of that identity is otherwise wanted. Or the suspect may be detained while it is determined if, in fact, an offense was occurred, has occurred in the area. I mean, they're going to say, well, you know, something along the line of so-and-so has happened in the past or it has not it has happened recently, so we just want to make sure it's not happening again, so give us your ID. Okay, but still, what does that have to do with me? What is whatever it is you're saying has happened in the past around this area, how is it involved in this specific circumstance of me doing what I'm doing here? That's what you need to put into account. That's what ha that is what needs to be articulable and objective. The subjective part based on their experiences, they're saying it has happened before. Well, there's another criteria, which is the objective aspect of how does it apply to this circumstance? Keep that in mind. Or the suspect may be detained while it is determined, in fact, if an offense has occurred in the area, a process which might involve taking a certain premise, locating, the examining, locating and examining object abandoned by the suspect or talking with other people. If it is known that an offense has occurred in the area, then the suspect may be viewed by witness, witnesses to the crime. There is no reason to conclude that any investigative method of the type just listed are inherently objectionable. There is no reason to conclude that any investigative method of the type just listed are inherently objectionable. They might cast doubt upon the reasonableness of the detention. However, if their use makes the period of detention unduly long, remember the tourist stop has to be brief. And even though all these other stuff that they just spoke about, something has happened before, they have to speak with other people, the totality of circumstance, or other whatever it is that they're trying to trace to you or a group of people, those things still might cast doubt on the reasonableness of the detention, meaning it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. It has to be beyond reasonable doubt. It has to be beyond reasonable doubt, meaning it's clear as day. There's no ifs, ands, or but. There's no suggestion that someone said, well, he might have a weapon on him. And so because of that, well, the caller said you might have a weapon, so we have to search you. No, 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 no. That's not reasonable suspicion. That's not reasonable beyond doubt. That still leaves doubt because it's a suggestive call. So it has to be beyond reasonable doubt. It has to be brief. 
has to be based on a totality of circumstance, it has to be articulable, and that articulation has to be objective. And if the search is done, it has to be in the outer layer. However, if their use makes the period of detention unduly long or involves moving the suspect to another locale, then it can cast doubts and it's not reasonable. If it's too long or requires you to do some extra stuff, then it is not a terror stop. That is a whole other thing. Are you seeing it? Now, at this point, you might be wondering, why do we even need to figure all these details out? Well, because all these details is your right. If you don't know these details, you don't know your right. Why is probable cause not enough? Why is probable cause in itself not enough? Because probable cause was not defined. And most people, let's be honest, most people don't know what probable cause means. And guess what they're saying about probable cause? In the 1983 case, Illinois versus Gates, this is how they define probable cause. This is that judge made law that defines probable cause. Everyone is talking about probable cause, probable cause. What is it? And how does it relate to all these things we're talking about? It tells you this is a Supreme Court case as these comments illustrate probable cause is a fluid concept turning on the assessment of probabilities in particular factual context meaning you have to intertwine loose ends of what if but probably maybe hence the word probable meaning just the probability you have to now fine tune it into a very specific fact. And that fact is not readily or even usefully reduced to a neat set of legal rules. Meaning every situation is always different. And because of that, they cannot fine tune probable cause to just mean one specific thing and apply it as a blanket to everything else when it comes to every different types of crime. If that was the case, most people wouldn't have liberties. So that way, probable cause has to be left as a fluid concept that would apply specific or particular to factual context, mean context, meaning based on each situation. And they break down these factual contents in Terry versus Ohio and within the definition of a reasonable suspicion which we've gone over and we'll be going through more case laws. Let's go to the next one. Next, the infamous Terry versus Ohio. This Supreme Court case law was what really made all the difference as to what probable cause is, what reasonable suspicion is, what cops can do when they approach you or not. Remember we were speaking about what is detainment, arrest, or seizure. Well, Terry versus Ohio, judge made law, the Supreme Court ruling, tell you, certiorari is like an appellate level for Supreme Court. So you have an appellate, appeal decisions made on whatever the trial court is on the, for the state level. Then you have certiorari, which is appeal on the Supreme Court level. Meaning if appeal on the low level doesn't work, you can take it to the Supreme Court. That's as far as it goes. And here it is. They are telling you what it means to detain. What does that word detain? Everybody throws it around. Am I being detained? Am I being detained? What does it mean? If you know what this means, which, believe it or not, puts you in a superior position, you would actually use these foundational principles and create the pace of that conversation based on it. And if you're good at it enough, you will set them up. Because most of them like to approach you like they know something. You can set them up. Whether it's through your own recording, which by the way, they have no reasonable expectation of privacy while they're doing their job. And if they're acting in their personal capacity and they're violating the Constitution's secure right, even better. 
they have no reasonable expectation of privacy because now it's a private conversation between you and them and it, no eavesdropping applies because you are one of the people in that conversation get it or if they are recording it with their squad camera or their body worn camera all those things that you be setting up sending them up with you have a record of it if you know what it is that you're talking about merely asking that my being detained is not sufficient for anyone to think oh wait this guy is setting me up or for you to be able to free yourself in that moment without any bs occurring for you to be able to stand your ground quote unquote stand on your square so here it is know what it means to be detained it goes on to say we thus decide nothing today concerning the constitutional propriety of an investigative seizure upon less than the probable cause for purposes of detention obviously not all personal intercourse between policemen and citizens involve seizure of person only when the officer by means of physical force or show of authority meaning they're telling you it's an order it's an order and the 30 or the show of authority means it's founded upon constitutional principles that's the only way that they can show authority has in some way restrained the liberty of a citizen may we conclude that the seizure has occurred so what is a seizure whenever your liberty has been restrained by way of either physical force or show of authority a part of the constitution that talks about no person shall be searched or seized without warrant what does it mean to be seized whenever you are restrained of your liberties by show of physical force by for physical force or show of authority Authority does not constitute someone barking demands at you. If the demands are lawful, then that is the show of authority. Or if they use physical force, they have seized you. It can be constitutional or not. But if you are restrained one way or the other, you're seized. And if the physical force is not constitutional, then you better know how to enforce it. We cannot tell with any certainty upon this record whether any such seizure took place here prior to Officer McFadden's initiating a physical contact for purpose of searching blah, 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 blah. So there it is. That is the definition of, of seizure. They're giving it to you. They are telling you Moving on to the next one. Then at a later date, remember the Terrier versus Ohio defines seizure, and that is the year 1968. At a later date, another Supreme Court case, California versus Hodari, Hodari D, the year 1991, expounds on what seizure means based on something called a Mendenhall test. It goes on to say, in seeking to rely upon the test here, respondent fails to read it carefully. It says that a person has been seized only if, not that he has been seized whenever, meaning it's very specific. The conditions behind seizure is very, very specific. So if you're reading that constitution and you're seeing seizure, searched, probable cause, and you don't know how these terminologies are defined, especially the specificity of it, and you're just broadly using it because you read some PDF or you heard someone, but you're not looking deep into the case laws that you yourself are aware about the judge made laws, so and so, the pillar court, so and so, you're not reading it because they're interpreting what those things mean. You're setting yourself up for failure. So we've seen that in order for a seizure to be established, that seizure that's spoken of in the Fourth Amendment or whatever section it is in your respective state constitution, 
and the Supreme Court Appellate Court case, Terry versus Ohio, 1968, which established the Terry stop. They're telling you seizure basically means if a physical force is used to restrain your liberty, or if a show of authority. That show of authority is based on constitutional principles, and is based on the list of all the things we've read on about what a Terry stop really means. This case then expounds on it to let you know seizure is very specific. It's not just any given situation. It goes on to say, it states necessary, a necessary but not a sufficient condition for seizure, or more precisely, for seizure effected through a show of authority. Mendenhall, which is another case law which they term this test Mendenhall after. Mendenhall establishes that the test for existence of a show of authority, meaning, okay, Terry versus Ohio says, wait, in order for you to seize, a show of authority has to be provided. So now, what is a show of authority? The Mendenhall test lets you know what it is. A show of authority is an objective one, meaning it can be something just based on your biased interpretation. It has to be neutral. It's a fact. Now, whether the citizen perceived that he was being ordered to restrict his movement, but whether the officer's words and actions would have conveyed that to a reasonable person, application of this objective test was the basis for our decision in the other case principally relied upon by respondent where we concluded that the police cruiser's slow following of the defendant did not convey the message that he was not free to disregard the police and go about his business. We did not address in Chestnut, however, the question whether if the mental test, mental hall test was met, if the message that the defendant was not free to leave had been conveyed, the fourth amendment seizure would have occurred. Meaning if they tell you you cannot leave, and you ask them what is the reason of articulable suspicion and they give it to you, then you're seized. But if they don't, that isn't a lawful order. That is not a show of authority. It has to be specific. It goes back to the list of things we've said. It all ties together. Moving on to the next one. Next. Does this apply to traffic situations? regardless of whether you're moving or parked. Well, leave it to the appellate decision. State of Tennessee. State of Tennessee. State of Tennessee. Meaning if you want, you can use a full faith and credit card clause. But why would you want to use this? But nonetheless, if you're in Tennessee, yes. The whole concept of requirement of uh, the Fourth Amendment and seizure, Terry stop, all that, in Tennessee, doesn't apply. Because it states that in the state versus pulley case law, states that a police officer may approach a car parked in a public place and ask for driver identification and proof of vehicle registration without any reasonable suspicion of illegal activity. Meaning you being presumed to be engaging in commerce, then well, you're obligated to show it because you've entered into a private contract. And there are a lot of terms and conditions within that that mandate you within the vehicle code and the code of federal regulations and within the state version that says you, you have no choice. That ID, that driver's license, it's not your property, it's the state's. So when demanded of it, you gotta give it up. And Tennessee basically brings that up without really saying it. And they're letting you know. So in traffic situations, if you're holding someone else's private instruments, then you cannot be afforded or expected privacy in any way. Because that property that you're holding called a driver's license is not yours. So if you've yet to figure out how to maneuver around without the driver's license in a lawful way, based on international law, oh well. But we've spoken about that on the Patreon. So go check that out. The solution is right there. Moving on to the next one. 
So, since the Terror versus Ohio was a Supreme Court of United States, and each state still retained its own sovereign powers based on its own individual state constitutions, that means they can either adopt it because they're a part of the United States, the Union, Articles of Confederation, a perpetual union, I meaning even if those new states did not exist back in 1717, if they eventually existed, they are automatically deemed to be joined into the Confederation because it's perpetual. So nonetheless, they can adopt the Supreme Court ruling or not because the founding document of each state is the Constitution of each state on the state level. So because of the Supreme Court ruling, it does not always always apply to each state. Each state can either adopt it as uniformity or not. And the court case, Hybel versus 6th Judicial District Court in Nevada, Humboldton County, 2004, recent, lets you know that. Basically says, look, this Terry Stock rule of Supreme Court applies and varies state by state. If the common law of the state and the legislature of the state accepts it, cool. If not, not so much. So, in other words, some states have adopted it and say, look, if a cop approaches you and asks you for your ID, you have to accept it. Others say, no, if a crime first has to have been undisputably committed, which initiates an investigation. So that Terry versus Ohio decision is still nonetheless very broad. It has a very broad interpretation and it trickles down to what your state accepts it as. The key to it is to look into your stop and identify state laws. And here it is, letting you know, look, it all depends on the decision of the state. It goes to say, stop and identify statutes often combine elements of traditionally vagrancy laws, traditional vagrancy laws, with provisions intended to regulate police behavior in the course of investigatory stop, aka Terry stop, which you just spoke about. The statutes vary from state to state, but all permit officer to ask or require the suspect to disclose his identity. To ask is one thing, and to require is another. Two separate things. A few states model their statutes on the Uniform Arrest Act, like they have the Uniform Co Commercial Code in each state, just as they do within the uni UCCs, and like they have the Uniform Probate Code, just like they do in the USCs and the state codes, just like they have the Uniform Trust Code, so-and-so, well, when it regards to specific subject matters like arrest, there's something called Uniform Arrest Act. And the East State might adopt it if they want and incorporate it into specific aspects related to arrests or not. A model code that permits an officer to stop a person reasonably suspected of committing a crime and demand of him his name, address, business, abroad, the wither, he is going. Other statutes are based on the text proposed by the American Law Institute. By the way, these are the people, these are the group of lawyers that basically trace the laws. If you didn't know. The USC's and state codes and all that. As part of the Institute's model penal code. The provision originally designated provides that a person who is loitering under circumstances which justify suspicion that he may be engaged or about to engage in a crime commits a violation if he refuses the request of the peace officer that he identify himself and give a reasonably credible account of the lawfulness of his conduct and purpose meaning there has to be an underlying cause with merit meaning you've already committed a crime and because you've committed it and we're investigating it investigatory stop terry stop you have to give us ID. That's one. It then goes on to say, in some states, a suspect's refusal to identify himself is a misdemeanor offense or a civil violation. I Meaning just by itself, it's a misdemeanor. I Meaning there has to be nothing underlying. It goes on to expound and says, in others, other states, it is a factor to be considered 
and whether the suspect has violated loitering laws. In this case, they're just using loitering as an example because that's the specific thing regarding the Ohio versus 6th Judicial District and as it's tied into identification. And it brought up the subject matter of investigatory stops, which is Terry stop. And then the judge had to clarify that, okay, look, some states require an actual crime to exist and all the prerequisites of a crime before they can begin to ask you for ID, AKA search or seizure of your person's effect properties. Other states, your mere act of refusing is the crime because if they ask for it, regardless of whether the investigation or not is going on, if you refuse, that's a crime. It then goes on into the history. Stop and identify statutes have their roots in early English vagrancy laws that require suspected vagrants to face arrest unless they give a good account of themselves. A power that itself reflected common law rights of private persons to quote, arrest any suspicious night walker and detain him till he gives a good account of himself. So now you see all these municipal police are enforcing common law against you that you, the everyday private man, has. They are flipping the game on you. Why? Because you don't know about it. You're stuck on one verbiage, probable cause. You're stuck on one verbiage, warrant. Stay stuck on it and keep watching them flip that which rightfully belongs to you into theirs. And they're going to be using it against you. That is why it's important to know these subtle details. Know it. Learn it. It's really not that complex once you really get it. Chew it at a time. Don't try to combine it all at once and get it. But once you chew it a little bit at a time and you get it, it makes very simple sense. And it becomes something that just naturally clicks in your mind. All these things that they're doing against you, where they can approach you in some states without a preceding or crime that has occurred. That is a right that you, the private man, has to keep the society at large safe your fellow man and woman but you haven't been enforcing it you haven't been doing it but guess what they flipped it and are using it against you now it doesn't mean you don't have the right if you're not careful and you don't know these basics and you don't enforce it it will get worse the court held that a traditional vagrancy law was void for vagueness it's broad scope and in precise terms denied proper notice to potential offenders and permitted police officers to exercise unfeathered discretion in the enforcement of the law. The vagrancy law of demanding someone anything until you prove yourself right, aka you are not presumed innocent. You are presumed guilt. Hence, you have to give a good account of yourself. And the cops are using this against you now, and it has been adopted in certain states, arising out of this ancient English law, which is incorporated into the Terry versus Ohio, which is incorporated into the Mendenhall test, and all these other case laws we just read. Moving on to the next one.